Good morning, and uh, it is a joy again to be with you, uh, teaching from our series, From Slavery to Sonship. This day is uh, particularly important because we camp on the famous Ten Commandments, or the commandments that God gave the children of Israel. Before we jump onto that, let me, let me lead, you, uh, lead us in prayer, and let's ask God's blessing today so that our minds are focused on the Word of God. One of the things I love to praise is, God, help me to hear right. Help me to hear what you exactly need me to hear. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to hear what you have for us. Lord, as a way of helping us, Lord, may you help us block out all voices that are not yours so that we can narrow in to the voice that's truly yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for jumping on this call, or on this uh, uh, broadcast this today, and I hope that you are settling down and you have, you know, you're worshiping God with us wherever you are. And we've been going through this series called From Slavery to Sonship. And like I said, we are camping today and following with the children of Israel as we see them walk through that pattern of God saving them, establishing them. Then they tend to always fall into the, in sin or fall into rebellion. And then God is going to do something to pull them out of that, remind them of who he is, and then he's going to pull them out of that. And then the cycle seems to continue on and on. I'm, uh, my prayer for you is that you do not play out that cycle of God has saved me. And then I quickly forget what he has done to me. And I fall back into the things that enslave me. And then God has to come again and rescue me out of that. At this particular point, this, uh, our friends have just crossed over and now they are camping in Mount Sinai. They've just been rescued by God through the flooding, uh, through, and God used the flooding of, of the Red Sea to drown the armies of Egypt. And now they come into a place of, they're not yet in their destination, but they are not where they were before. They find themselves in what anthropologists call a liminal space. Now, I want to say a bit about what a liminal space is. So, in anthropology, liminality is the quality of ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stage of a rite of passage. When participants no longer hold their pre-ritual status, but have not yet begun the transition to the status they will hold when the rite is complete. During a rite's liminal stage, participants stand at the threshold, and I want us to use that word today, the Israelites stand at a threshold between their previous way of structuring their identity, their time and community, and a new way which completing the right will establish. So the children of Israel find themselves camping at the foot of Mount Sinai, which we would say are the threshold. They have been in Egypt for over 400 years. And having lived with the Egyptians for over 400 years, many things have come and gone. One of the things that you will come to notice is while they lived in Egypt, they didn't have a set of laws given to them by God. And so there is a high chance that that community was disconstructed to the degree that they started to look and talk like the Egyptians. And God is speaking to them that I want to make you into a people that are mine. 
but they are not yet God's people to that extent. So they find themselves at this place called the threshold. Let's read Exodus 19 for you to see exactly what I'm trying to say. Exodus 19 verses 3 says, While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, to the people of Israel, You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the people of Israel. So God is up to something, just like God is up to something in your life. He says, you yourself have seen what I did to the armies of Egypt and how I bore you on eagles' wings. And now he says, if you obey me, I will make you among the people of the earth. You will be a special people to me. You will be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests unto God. So that's the final destination. That's what God wants to make of the children of Israel. They have moved from a culture and community and identity that God is not approving of. They find themselves in this liminal space and they need to go to or travel or journey into their identity as God's people. For God to accomplish that, he calls Moses up on the mountain and he's going to give him a set of laws. There is no community that is built that does not have value or a value system that they live by. And so if you were to think of the Ten Commandments, you would narrow them down and bring them down to both principles of life that God wants them to have, or you could say these are the value system or this is the value system that God is giving them. For you to be a holy people, a nation of priests unto God, this is how you will begin to live. And then he adds on to that to say, if you live by this, by obeying this, it says this, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. I love those words. When you do what God asks you to do, he says, you will be my treasured possession. Think about it. If you had a treasured possession, what do you do about it? You think about it. You protect it. You, you, if it was a watch given to you and it's a treasured possession, maybe it's uh, you know, it's very expensive. You would clean it. You will always have it in a safe somewhere so that it does not get out of your reach or someone doesn't take it away from you. God is saying to us today that we are his treasured possession. And how do I know that? Because Jesus has come and he has died and he has resurrected, but so that we can be God's people. He has also given us an identity based on how we should live. And how should we live? So we should live just like Christ lived. That's now our manifesto. That's our value system. That's our identity. And so a nation finds itself in this threshold or liminal space where this is forming and God gives them the Ten Commandments. A lot of people, when they hear the word Ten Commandments, or when they hear about the Ten Commandments, 
will quickly go into the legalistic way of thinking, which is, if I keep all these laws, then I will make God happy. It's a narrow mindset. It is a mindset which God wants us to, to take out or to delink from ourselves or to delink ourselves from that mindset, which is, I am pleasing God by keeping the law. Whereas, really, the truth of the matter is, the laws were given to us because we did not have an identity. We came from that which was not God's, and yet we have not yet entered into that which is God's. And so for us to enter into the city, the lifestyle, the pattern that blesses or, or, or is God's, God gives us a set of rules, or we call them regulations, we call them commands. He gives us that. For what? For our happiness. Friends, so let's see, for example, the first commandment, as we will see, is you shall not have any other God apart from God himself. Now, that's important because these guys are coming from, from Egypt, the land of many gods, small g. The land of many, many, many gods. In fact, when we see uh, the judgment on the house of Pharaoh, it was literally judgment upon the gods of Egypt. And God says, that's not the value I want you to have. And you will know something about your life currently is that God says you used to, if you're a Christian now, you used to live in that way where you were driven by your passions. You literally were idol worshipers. It's idolatry. You were worshiping things. But now that you have come to Jesus, he gives you a different set of values to live by. One, he says, you will have priority when it comes to the God you serve. God and God alone, Jehovah, will be your God. And that you will not share that affection with anything or any other God. You see, friends, once we were slaves, now we have been delivered from slavery. We were slaves to sin. We also find ourselves at the place where we need to reach and grab a hold of our new identity in Christ. And once we come into our new identity with Christ, God says, now this is how we are going to live. And when he says, this is how we are going to live, it's not so that primarily we would please him, but so that we would experience the exact same joy that he carries. It is for our joy that he gives us a way of life that we should live. And we're going to see that. So the law or the Ten Commandments, were preparing them on how to live in the promised land. The law both covered the outward actions and inward motivations. God knew perfectly that they would not keep the law. But he also knew that if they engaged themselves in obeying the law, what would happen would be that they would, have, they would experience a, a character change. God wanted them to change in their hearts, not to change what they did necessarily, but as they obey that, they were forming in their hearts. These Ten Commandments were given as a care plan, an action plan, for how to do life together in relationship with God and with your fellow man. So God's not just saying, 
hey, continue living the way you came out of Egypt. No, he's saying, I want to teach you how to live with God and how to live with your fellow man. That's going to be for your joy. You see, friends, if, we, if a child is growing up in a home and is not taught how to play with other children, the child tends to be naturally inward-looking, selfish, and destructive when it comes to playing with other children. What socialization, a good socialization is, is we train a child in how to interact with other children. We create fair uh, play rules, just like we do that in football and other sports. We create rules so that there is joy in the outcome. But where there is no rules and no values and no uh, principles to live by, people will destroy people. So the law was a way for them to know how to be in right relationship with God and the house of Israel. The law, by the way, was seen as a gift. It was not the worst thing you could receive. In fact, it was the best thing God would have given you at that time. David writing in Psalm 19 from 7 to 10 says this, The law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Like that amazing poetic language just to say what God was giving the children of Israel was not the worst thing they could receive. It was the best of the best they could receive at that time, both helping them in their up relationship with God and their, their out relationship with man. God was simply saying, this community will be the best community on earth and other nations will envy how you live your lives. Friends, when you think of the Ten Commandments, I would love the same emotion to fill your heart, just like David is saying, the law of the Lord refreshes my soul. When you think of the scriptures today, don't look at them and say, oh, that book of regulations and rules of do's and don'ts. No. Look at them as the thing that would refresh my soul. The kind of path and value that God wants me to hang on to that will fill me with joy and give other people joy and cause us to live in community in a way that other people look in and say, I want to be part of that community. And sometimes this law, because they are not primarily, some of them are not written directly for our benefit. For example, when you say, oh, you shall worship only one God, sometimes you feel like, God's restricting me to just one. But think of it when he says, you shall not murder. How many of you would love this to be the jungle of the free where anything goes? Not many of us would love that. Why? Because we know our lives will be in danger. But we love it when those who have done something against humanity can be brought to justice. We love it when we see justice happening because we say that's a fair society. That's right. But when it is against us or when something is done against us or it will not work for us, we tend, from a human perspective, to complain about that. And so God will give the laws and the rules so that everyone would live in a community with an identity 
as God's people, God's chosen people, God's holy nation, a nation of priests and kings. I borrowed a few of these explanations from a preaching done by Robert Morris. And in one of his books, he writes, and he took the Ten Commandments and he labeled them the rules of relationships. But also broke it down to principles that you can draw out of the Ten Commandments. And because of time, we're not going to go trying to explain each principle, but I would love just to name them and then uh, bring this to a close. So, if you're following with me from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1 to 17, then you will see the Ten Commandments in their full length there, elaborated in their full length. But I just want to begin, and I will quote one and tell you the principle that you can draw out of that. So, number one, the principle of priority. And the law there is this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Priority. My priority will be God and God alone. Number two, the principle of purity. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And quickly, just to say, the law or the principle of purity there is we defile ourselves when we worship multiple gods. Gods that have no inten- good intentions of our life. And so God wanted us to narrow down to purity where our hearts are drawn to God and God only. So it's calling us away from idol worship. Number three is the principle of humility. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And you may wonder where is humility there? It's because the Lord's name is similar to the Lord's person or character. God's name is God's person and it is God's character. When we take up the Lord's name in vain, we raise ourselves above. That's pride. We raise ourselves above God. And the Bible says this in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, humble yourself under God's mighty arm and he will lift you up. And yes, you like John the Baptist, he says, I, I, I reduce that he may increase. And when we take up God's name, we literally, in vain, we take up God's character for granted. We take up God himself for granted. That means we raise ourselves above our creator. And God's calling us to humility, where we are careful not to take his name, his character, his person with contempt. The principle of rest is number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And all of you know, uh, just that's the principle of rest. God is protecting you from dying and burnout. And God himself, as if pride was not enough, we sometimes overwork, overdo, and we do not pause and allow our souls to recover or our souls to catch up with us. God himself was not proud to avoid rest. He rested on the seventh day. And if God, the creator of the universe, rested, why not me? I will rest. It's a principle. Principle, a following principle is a principle of honor. 
Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord your God is giving you. That's again self-explanatory. And then there's a principle of love. You shall not murder. And principle of intimacy. You shall not commit adultery. And then we have the principle of trust. You shall not steal. And principle of honesty. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And then we have finally the principle of contentment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is in your neighbor's. And so we see these 10 laws or 10 principles or values that God is giving, and we just want to draw this one conclusion, friends. God loved the community of Israel, his people, so much, and he rescues them from slavery, but realizes that these people have no set of values that will enhance community, enhance their relationship with God, and fill their community with joy. These people don't have the identity that will make them a desired and envied people on earth. And so he gave them a gift, as we see David saying, the law of the Lord is delightful. It, is, it satisfies the soul. It revives the soul. God was giving them a gift that would both give them identity and give them a way of life that everyone else would want to draw from. Today, most laws of the world were drawn or built from the foundation of these Ten Commandments. As you read and listen to these scriptures today, may you receive the Ten Commandments as a gift from God, guiding you into identity and into a way of life that is life-giving. Shall we pray? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. We ask that you have spoken to us. We ask that you continue to speak to us and help us to be quick to, uh, to, to be doers of the word, quick to be hearers and quick to be doers. In Jesus' name, amen.